We're in the middle of this study uh, where we've been looking at the good and beautiful life, this, this life that Jesus invites us into. And on Easter Sunday, we talked about uh, the reality that God has a different life for us than what the world presents. And, and then since Easter, we've been kind of unpacking, what does this life look like? What is it what does it look like to live the good and beautiful life that God has for us? And, and, I, and I've said this every Sunday, and I'll say it again tonight, or, or this morning. Uh, if, if you, what you hear this morning may sound a little bit unrealistic, apart from a relationship with Christ. Uh, it, it's going to seem like, like, maybe why would I even want to do that, or uh, why there's no way I could even ever try to achieve that. Like, I know I would fail within 30 minutes, you know, so why would I even bother to put the effort forth? And, and the secret is, is that apart from Christ, we can't do any of this. We will not be able to live the life that Jesus invites us into apart from his grace. It is totally God's grace and power at work within us that enables us to live life the good and beautiful way. And so this morning, if, you, if you're uh, just curious about who God is and, and you've not taken that step of entering into a relationship with him, then, then let me encourage you to listen today, but to listen with ears like, is this something that sounds appealing? Is this something that, that I would like to experience myself? And, and if so, then that first step for you is going to be uh, coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I would love to be able to walk you through what that looks like and how you can go about doing that. Uh, for those of you who have, who have entered into that relationship, we're talking about what does life look like with Jesus? What, what is his uh, example for how we should go about living? What is the good and beautiful life? And, and so to help us in our, in our study, we've been looking at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 again this morning as we look at the topic of learning to live without lying. We started by talking about learning to live without anger. And uh, boy, that was, that was one that we all kind of like went, Ugh. Uh, because sometimes anger is one of those things we like, right? It helps us to kind of get through things. Uh, and then last week we talked about learning to live without lust, and there were some of us that went, ugh, uh, because we, we, we felt that one grabbing us in our hearts and saying, man, I do look at people sometimes as uh, based on what I can get out of them instead of how I can bless them. Uh, and so we were challenged in that regard. And this morning, Jesus challenges us in regards to our words. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 33 down through verse 37. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and I believe that's what's on the screen behind me if I did the computer work right yesterday. You have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows, you must carry out your vows you make to the Lord. But I say... Do not make any vows. Do not say, by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say, by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say, by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say, by my own head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Let's pray. God, as we look into your word this morning, I pray that you would guide our hearts and our minds, that you would help us to hear from you, that your word would, would be spoken to us through your Holy Spirit as you communicate with our hearts directly. And Lord, I pray that we might have open hearts to hear and to listen and then to apply your truth to our lives today. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There was a pastor who, uh, I didn't do this last week because I thought it was a little manipulative, but uh, uh, there was a pastor that I was reading about that the week before he was going to preach on the topic of lying, uh, told his congregation he was going to be preaching on Mark chapter 17 and asked them to read that chapter ahead of time. And so uh, the following week he came in and he, he uh, asked the congregation, how many of you uh, read Mark chapter 17 last week? And, and about a third of the congregation raised their hand or half, somewhere in that range. And uh, the pastor said, well, there is no Mark chapter 17. And now we're going to be preaching on the sermon. I'm going to preach my sermon on the topic of lying. And he proceeded. Um, 
So I, 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 did, I, I thought, maybe, well, I could have done that last week, but I thought, well, maybe that's a little bit manipulative, and uh, I, some of you might get really mad at me <laughs> if I did that too. But, but you know, lying, it's, it's such a part of our culture, isn't it? Like, lying, we, we almost uh, have become accustomed to people lying to us. How many of you have ever been lied to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, everybody raises their hand, right? Because if you're a parent, you've been lied to by your kids. If you've maybe bought something from somebody and, and they maybe didn't uh, tell you the truth about it, uh, maybe you were suckered in by a good advertisement. Uh, and so uh, advertisements, you know, they're always, like, lying to us. Uh, I was looking at these uh, ads, you know, like, when I was in Houghton, uh, they, they did a preview for... Uh, they did some pictures for one of the advertising magazines, pamphlet things that they hand out, you know, to prospective students. And so they wanted to get a shot of students in the dining hall. And so my, my friends and I were selected to be part of this picture. I don't think they ever used it. Probably, you know, as soon as they saw my ugly mug in there, they're like, we can't put that one there. Um, but uh, so they brought us in the dining room and we're sitting there and it was the best looking food I've ever seen in the dining hall. <laughs> I mean, it was great, except it was all rubber. It wasn't, it was like cold and rubbery, like they had, I don't know what they had done to the chicken, but they had been told, I mean, there was like more hair gel on that chicken than there, than there is in Elijah's head, you know. Um, and uh, so, so uh, it, it, it was just, it was such, so fake. And, and, you know, we're like supposed to be pretending to eat this stuff and we're like, <laughs> You know, it was terrible. You took, a, you actually took, we, some of us like took a bite of it and we almost puked on there. Maybe that's why they didn't use our, it was hard to get a real happy face after you bit into that chicken, I'll tell you. Uh, but but we, we're, we have this kind of like, this lies are, are just everywhere in our culture, right? From advertisers to politicians to lawyers reframing the story, we're so accustomed to lying. So we're skeptical. Like probably skepticism is the major milieu of our culture, right? It's, it's a defining characteristic of our culture. We are skeptical of people. Like you watch something uh, on, on uh, the TV or you hear an advertisement or you see something in, in the paper or whatever, and you're like, oh, it's too good to be true, right? That's one of the first things that comes to our mind. It's too good to be true because we're skeptical, because lies are such a common thing in our culture. It's interesting to me that one of the key characteristics of young people uh, is that they value authenticity. And why do you think that's so? I think it's because we've become such a culture of lying and manipulating the truth that the next generations coming behind us are like, just be real. Just be authentic. Just be honest. And they value that because they're so sick of this manipulation of truth. They're sick of us misleading people with our words and our lies. Why do we lie? You know, so, so why do we? If, if, this is, if this is something that, like how many of you like to be lied to? Nobody. But all of us raised our hand that we've been lied to, but none of us like to be lied to. So why do we lie? What, what is it about lying? Uh, there was a Sunday school teacher once that, uh, had been teaching online at the end of the, uh, the lesson, she gave the students this, this quiz and she, she asked the students, what is a lie? And one little boy's answer was terrific. He goes, a lie is an abomination before God and a very present help in times of trouble. <laughs> uh, we could all say amen to that one, right? Like, we, we, we lie to protect us, right? We, to avoid consequences, do you get that report in? Yep, yep, got it, got it. Uh, it might not, I, I've got to email it to you yet, but it's all done. You know, and you're back there scrambling to finish that thing up. Yeah, we lie to protect us from punishment or from consequences. This is, you know, typical kids, right? They, don't, they know that what they've done is wrong, and so to protect themselves from getting a timeout or whatever discipline uh, you're going to uh, put on to them. They're like, oh, I didn't do that. That was, that, that was my sister or that was my brother or whatever it was, you know, and, 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 and we shift the blame. We, we lie to keep from hurting others. This, 
Have, men, have you, has your wife ever asked you, does this dress make me look fat? How are you supposed to answer that if it does? Do you say yes? <laughs> There's wisdom there. <laughs> right? so, so sometimes we lie to protect people. We don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. Maybe, maybe it's not following your convictions when you're in a group of people who, who don't believe the same way you do, and so you, you change, you lie about what you believe because you don't want to hurt them or offend them. You don't want to disappoint somebody. So, so you, you, maybe you did something you know they're not going to like, and it's not like they're, gonna, they're in a position to punish you, but it's more of a position where, where what you did is going to cause them pain, and so you... You lie about it because we don't want to hurt somebody else that we love. Sometimes we lie because we're insecure about our own identity. Right? Like, have you ever been in, uh, with somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I was reading this book. Have you, have you read that? You know, and you're like, oh man, this, sound, you know, this is a person that I want to impress. So I was at, at Houghton last week, I, I was talking about, and, and uh, Dr. Case was uh, there and I was talking with him and he's like, Oh, so what books are you using with your class? And I was telling him, and he's like, oh, well, uh, did you read this book? And, and immediately I'm thinking, man, if I didn't read that book, I'm not going to look very smart, right? Like this is, and, and so there was this immediate temptation to go, uh, I'm familiar with it, but I didn't read it, you know? And, and, and we begin to kind of like, is it, you know, we kind of like a half truth, right? Like, I didn't read it, but, but I've heard of it, right? And I'm like, I have no idea who he's talking about. And, but there's that, there's that pressure, right, to impress, to, to be thought of as somebody who's in the know. And so we, we lie. Lying helps us to satisfy our own desires. Sometimes we lie so that we can get something that we want. So, you know, uh, and resume embellishments. I was reading in the book that, that goes along with our series here, they said that uh, Managers figure that half of the information on resumes now is incorrect or untrue. 50% of what is on a resume has been embellished somehow. People lie. Some of you who are single, have you ever gone on to uh, uh, the dating profiles and like you look at the picture of the person, you know, online dating? I was going to look at Elijah's page and see if he had Will Smith up there, you know? Um, <laughs> Because you want, you, you like want to, I'm picking on Elijah tonight, uh, today, I'm sorry, man. So we, we, we put something up there that, that's not true, that's not legit, because we, we want to get something that we want. We want to present a false image so that we can impress people, and, and then we'll deal with the consequences later. We lie for all of these things. In Jesus' day, lying was, was just as common as in our day, and and in Jesus' day, like, lying was only bad if you got caught or if you hurt somebody with your lie. Like, if, 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 if you didn't hurt somebody directly or you didn't get caught, then it was okay to lie. And, and that, was, that was pretty much the narrative. And, and that's pretty much the narrative we have in today's culture, right? Like, uh, we don't like perjury in the courtroom because people get hurt when we perjure, when we lie in, in the courtroom. So, so that's still not okay, but if you don't get caught and beyond that, then it's pretty much like not a big deal, right? Like especially white lies. Like, like we listen to white lies and it's like, ah, don't worry about it. It's just a little white lie. Who cares? Who cares? Lies are bad if they hurt others or if you get caught. But otherwise, they are a very present help in times of trouble. It seems to be how we work in our day, and it's how it was in Jesus' day. But Jesus gives us a new narrative to live by. He gives us a, a new direction in, in response to our words. He says, first of all, when we think about why we lie and, 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 and the reasons behind that, he addresses some of these, and he says, instead of trying to bolster your image through your words, what if we found our security, we found our identity somewhere else other than the image that we've crafted ourselves? What if we began to really believe that our identity is hidden in God with Christ? 
What if we actually believe that as, as, as Christians? Like, you don't have to go out there and try to impress people with who you are because your identity is hidden with Christ in God, and it can't be changed. This is who you are. That's what Paul writes to the Colossians, and, and he says, listen, your life, your very life, your, your very existence, your identity is secure in Jesus Christ. Like, like, you didn't make that happen. You can't work to make a better image, in, to make yourself look better in God's sight. God loves you just the way that you are, and his grace tells us that he accepts us and that he has welcomed us into his family and that your name is written on his palm and, and nothing's going to take that away. Our security doesn't have to be bolstered through false images that we, that we speak. Our security is in Jesus Christ. When we find our identity in God, we don't have to, to constantly be worrying about what do people think of me? Because honestly, our only concern needs to be what does God think of me? And God thinks you're awesome. God thinks of you as his child. When, when, when we have surrendered our life to Christ and we have embraced his love, you have no worries as far as who you are. You don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to lie to try to bolster our image. Your identity is secure and does not need to be held up by lies. Well, Jesus also pushes us to have an integrity of character, to have consistency in such a way that our words and our actions match. You see, this is where Jesus is talking about here in, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about, don't swear by uh, heaven or by the earth or by the temple or by even your head. So in Jesus' day, what people would do is, like, if you wanted to assure somebody that you were telling the truth, you would claim the authority of something really important. And so, like, if you really wanted to get somebody to, to believe you, you would go, you know, this is, I, I, this, this horse is, is a great horse. By heaven, she's the best, you know. And, and so what are you doing? You're invoking the authority of heaven to say, listen, this, this horse is as good as heaven, or this horse is as, is as sure as the temple, or, or by the hairs on my head, you know, which is becoming increasingly fewer and fewer. Uh, but... And you would, you would try to, to take something physical, something that had authority, and you would lay that out. And so people just began piling up like these levels of authority, uh, like stacking dominoes on top of each other to try to show that what they were saying was legit. And Jesus says, this is getting ridiculous, right? Like, you know, you've got a whole page of things to, to try to assure me that what you're telling me is true. Why don't you just tell me the truth? Why don't you just tell me the truth? Just be a person of character. Those of you who are Princess Bride fans out there, remember the scene uh, right before uh, Will is captured and taken down into the pit of despair and, uh, you know, Prince Humperdinck has told uh, the uh, princess uh, that he, he's going to actually, you know, send Will away and, and he's going to be safe and return him to his ship and all that. And so the princess exits the scene and then uh, the, the, the five-fingered man, uh, or the six-fingered man, um, you know, he, uh, he looks down and, and uh, Will looks up at him and goes, we are men of action. Lies do not become us. That's a great line, right? That's a great, great philosophy to live by. Like lies, like to have enough character that you just are like, why would I lie? Because that undermines who I am. It undermines my integrity of character. So instead of, of trying to bolster our, our character through lies or, or our identity through lies, Jesus says, listen, be a person of true character. Be a person of truth in speech. Good character leads to honest communication. So Jesus says, just say yes when you mean yes. And if you mean no, like if you're not going to do that, don't go, 
Well, maybe. Just, you know, have the guts to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Wow, how refreshing would that be if people actually communicated what they mean? Like, you've seen the commercials, right? About, you know, honest communication and stuff like that. And, 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 it's, and it's somewhat refreshing, isn't it? Like, what if we actually said what we mean? And what if the people of God actually embraced that? Think of the witness that that would be in the culture around us if people of God actually were honest instead of using their words to try to manipulate people or ideas. What if we respected and dignified others so much that we were willing to speak the truth to them? Now, Jesus helps us to understand that truth uh, can also be harmful, right? So Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, reminds us that we must speak the truth in love because sometimes the truth is uh, harmful. And so we have to think about how do we speak truth but do it in a way that builds people up instead of tears them down. Like if everybody came up to you today and said, man, that outfit just does not work. You should never wear that again. Right? Like you might be, you might just be crushed. Right? Or man, you're looking a whole lot heavier than last time I saw you. You, What are you doing? Right? Or man, where did all your hair go? Right? I mean, these could all be true statements. But not said with love, then we're still not carrying out the message of respect. And so Paul encourages us to, to think about when we, when we, if we're going to be people who are telling the truth, which I hope that we will embrace that, that we must do that in a way that builds people up as well. So speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4 verse 15. Now it's a real challenge to get both parts right. Like a lot of times we, we're loving, so no, that dress doesn't make you look fat right? That's, that's love. Truth is, man, that is, oh man, I, I have failed in this department sometimes. Karen bought, I, I remember one time she bought a new dress and uh, she, she really liked it and she had bought it without me being there and I, I try to encourage her to let me be there when she buys the dresses so that she gets ones that are good yeah, she's homesick today, so she doesn't, she, she won't hear, she doesn't know I'm sharing this story until all of you call her this afternoon and tell her. Um, so she puts, she puts on this dress when I get home. She's like, let me show you what I got. She comes out, I mean, she was just, <laughs> she looks, she looks at me and she's like, what do you think? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's all I, I just grunted. I just went, oh, <laughs> and uh, she has never worn that dress again. Never. It's still in her closet. She has never worn it. I go, so like, you know, after I realized what I had done was not good, like it was not love, <laughs> um, I'm like, it, it, looks, it looks good, you know, I just, it just didn't hit me right, you know, and, and, uh, and so <laughs> a couple months later, I'm like, why don't you wear that dress? And she's like, what, the uh dress, you know? <laughs> so it's, beca- it's, it's, it's got its own identity now uh, because of my uh, stupidity. Uh, in my response to her. But, but so so we, can, we can get truth right and we can get love right, but it's hard to get truth and love together right, isn't it? This is one of those areas where, like, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're, it's just not going to happen. Because it's God's Spirit that's going to check our words when we're going to say something like, oh. And it's the Spirit of God that gives us that capacity to love and to love people even when they're hard to love. And so the Spirit helps us to be able to speak truth and to speak love. So what's Jesus pushing us to? He's pushing us towards a simplicity of speech where our yes becomes yes and our no becomes no. Where we're able to simply and honestly communicate in a way that values the other person and holds that value of I want to encourage you and bless you but I also want to speak truth. And I'm not going to manipulate truth in order to make you like me. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Simple, honest communication that is sensitive. And so a couple of practical tips for us as we think about uh, these, these words, about learning to live without lying. The first thing that I would say is, if you struggle with this, 
Uh, and I think probably all of us do to some extent or another. If, if you don't think you struggle with lying, you might be lying to yourself. So think about you for a minute, all right? Just kind of focus inward. What is it that makes you lie? Like what's the, what's the primary impetus for, your, for the lies that, that come out of your mouth? Is it to avoid consequences? Maybe, maybe you've gotten past that one. That's, that's kind of a, a, a one that maybe we grow out of over time. Maybe, maybe it's not hurting other people, and so we're just so sensitive to other people's feelings that we don't speak the truth. Or maybe it's that we're insecure in who we are, and so we, we tend to get caught in this propping up our reputation by telling lies. So identify why it is that you lie. The second thing I would say is to think about the triggers. All right, so, so where, where are the places where you are most vulnerable? Like if it's propping up your identity, maybe when you are around people that you look up to, that's when you're going to be the most vulnerable to telling lies. And so uh, identify that, know that going in, and develop a plan, a strategy to think about, all right, when this, if, if people ask me something and I want to impress them, but yet I don't know what they're talking about, I'm going to simply be honest and say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't been exposed to that yet, or I don't know what that is, but I'm going to be honest. And, and so maybe if, that's, maybe if that's a situation for you, you go in and you remind yourself, my identity is in Christ, and I don't have to impress other people to be liked by the most uh, powerful person in the universe, God. Like, I'm already loved by the one who is more powerful than any other person could ever be. So I don't have to prop up my identity through these lies. So identify where, uh, what prompts you to lie. Identify those places or spaces that you are vulnerable in. And then pray up. Pray up before you go into places where you know you're going to be vulnerable. Ask God to help you to speak truth. Ask God to protect you from being afraid of what other people are going to think. And so uh, pray up. Pray up before you go into places where you know it's going to be a tough place for you to be able to speak the truth honestly. A third, a third thing that I would encourage us to do is to practice silence. Um, well, I put a get accountability on this one. So we'll, I'll flip-flop my notes since I see the screen is flip-flopped on me. Get accountability. So just like we talked about last week with uh, learning to live without lust, like if we don't talk about this with people, we're probably never going to see movement in our lives. And so maybe it's somebody in your small group. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a family member if you're uh, a, a teenager or a, or a child and, and you're, you, you, you talk to your parents and you say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Would you help me? Would you help me overcome this? Maybe it's a close friend. Maybe it's somebody in your small group. But, but have somebody that you talk to to say, you know, I'm, I'm really taking this seriously. I want to live without lying, and, and here's where I'm vulnerable. Here's, here's are the things that, that prompt me to lie. Would you help hold me accountable by asking me questions on how I'm doing from time to time? Would you live into my life in that way? so that I don't just keep perpetuating this cycle over and over and over, but instead I can see real change happen in my life. Hold me accountable to that. That's, what God, that's why God brought us together as, as a church family, so that we could encourage one another and walk with one another through life. So get accountability, and then lastly, practice silence. Learn to listen without having to speak. You know, we don't like silence in our culture. Like we put music on, we put uh, the TVs on, we have uh, earbuds in our ears all the time. We don't like to just sit and be silent. We're scared of silence. But it's in the silent moments that the Holy Spirit's able to speak to us the best. It's in learning to be silent that we, that we learn that we don't have to constantly be, be talking to uh, maintain our image. Silence is a good activity for trust. My grandfather was a man who I really looked up to. And he was a man of few words. But when he spoke, people listened. And I think in part because he was a man of few words. 
And so when he did speak, he had something really important to say. A lot of us minimize the important things we have to say because we're, always, we're, we're talking all the time. So everybody's just like so bored with our talk that when we do have something really important to say, they don't hear it because it just becomes part of the fuzz, part of the white noise coming out of our mouths continually. Learn to listen. I was reading Christianity Today last night and they just, and the latest issue had an article about one of the best ways that we can share our faith is to listen to people and to hear where they are hurting and to hear where they struggle with the Christian message and to begin to understand them so that we can empathize with them and then we can speak into those moments. Listening, being silent. It helps us learn not to have to talk and, and, not, and it helps us with our lying, but it also helps us with our witness. Jesus invites us to this good and beautiful life and one of the aspects of the good and beautiful life is life without lies. And so wherever it is that you might be struggling in this area, I would encourage you to take that step. Think about why it is that you would lie. Where are you vulnerable? Get some accountability. Practice silence. Let God bring a healing to your life and let, help him, or let him take you to that next level of intimacy with God. An intimacy that is true and honest and full of love. And he'll do the same thing in your relationships with other people as you do it with him. Let's pray. God, this morning, thanks for your, your word to us. It's a challenging word. It's a word that uh, hits all of us in various ways. And Lord, I pray that we would be willing to be honest with you, that we would not lie, that we wouldn't put up excuses today, but that we would open our, our hearts to you and say, God, uh, yeah, this is me. I, I, I'm, I'm guilty. And Lord, that you would, by your power, bring freedom in this area of our speech, that our speech might become pure and wholesome, truthful and full of love. And God, only you can do that. And so, Lord, remind us of where our security, where our identity lies. Remind us that we, that we are yours. Remind us that you love us unconditionally. And God, I pray that, that as a result of your reminders and of your presence in our lives, that we would become free to be able to speak truth to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.